food, food surface testing. Really, and, and look, look, there's ATP equipment out, out there and there's ones that detect grease. You know, you can do a swab and detect grease and whatever. That's all well and good, but it's not, um, gives you indicators, but it's not the specific requirement. The whole idea of your cleaning is to remove bugs from the surface. That's what we're all about, okay? And the only way to do that is to basically do it through a laboratory, is to get the number of bugs that are on that surface. Only ever, ever test properly cleaned and disinfected surfaces. You're not testing surfaces that don't come in contact with food door handles, walls, floors, um, or any surface that's presently in use. You know, if you're working on a bench and they're doing stuff, you don't go in and test that bench. I'm not interested. I know there's bugs on it because there's food on it. And food has bugs on it. You know, unless you actually lean carcasses of meat up against the wall, I don't see a reason in testing the wall or the door handle. What you should be testing is anything that comes in contact directly with food. So bowls, benches, storage tubs, cutting knives, slicing machines. Oh, there's a great one. Um, and cutting boards are the, the ones. And what you, you really should be doing is to go through and do an audit of your premises. List, and only in groups, except maybe for benches, all of the places that are it comes in contact with food. So you list, you know, storage, this size storage tubs, this, this size cutting, you know, or the cutting boards, or the benches, or the chefs, the large chef's knives, and whatever. Just draw a chart of all those groups of sites. I think the test is, should only be around 20 something dollars, and you may decide, doesn't matter, we can do one every this period in our budget. And then across the top, put weeks and or months of the year. And it might take you a year to go and test every every site, but you should be testing it regularly, one of those, at least one of those sites, and try and test it everything in, within a 12 month period, at least. Don't go through and once a year, we go and test all of our surfaces. That's, that's dumb. You need to get constant information. We found places where the supplier of the sanitizer changed the concentration by putting a little sticker over the top of the concentration, never told anybody, and they, obviously they decreased it, didn't change the price, didn't know about it. They used to make it up by filling it to this line on the, on the thing and then filling it to that line with water. And in fact, it was being so diluted, they didn't know about it and was actually having no effect at all. So if you do tests once a year, they found out, or every six months, they found out six months, the last six months worth of cleaning wasn't working. So you're better off, and, on, and doesn't say doing any more, but break your testing up throughout a year. So you're getting that information, okay? Um, and again, you know, not testing those other surfaces. Testing of staff hands, it's of limited use, you know, um, and the, the whole idea of, of gloves versus bare hands, you know, we could argue about that for, for a good half an hour easily, you know. People who like gloves is because it's great, and then you watch those people and the phone rings and they pick up the phone, or they go and pick up pens and, and write the stuff, and then someone else comes on and picks up that thing without gloves on, because it doesn't matter. Um, or they touch something, and with gloves you don't you don't notice it so much. Whether, whereas if you're using bare hands and you touch something that's contaminated, you know about it straight away and you go and wash your hands. So, I mean, in two minds. You know, sometimes in wearing gloves in front of the public is a brilliant idea. Just don't take the money in the same glove and don't use the register with the same glove. Um, you know, that just alarms people like me anyway. Um, maybe if you are having people who are, are using their hands, then screening it maybe for presence of absence of, of staff 
or E. coli it is a good idea. Um, something like what, 20 to 30 percent of all of us are Staph aureus carriers um, between our, our fingers and in, in, the, in the nose, under the armpit. Live with it, that's what it's got to be. Um, I'm giving a presentation later in the week to one of the food um, producers, food pack, yep, food pack, and I'm going through that, that food hygiene, all those, that situation. So uh, testing of hands, yeah, it might be worthwhile, but it's not something you rely a lot on. It's training and it is, is the important thing. Test surfaces prior to use, not after cleaning. There's no point in after you've cleaned, testing to see if the cleaning works. You want to test it just before you're about to use it. And that could be a day later, a cutting board as you pull it down off the thing. What we found in one premises was that overnight, the owner of the building um, was saving money. So shut down the um, air conditioning system. And in fact, the um, road works outside because of the winds. It was blowing dust and dirt into the building, which was settling on all these surfaces. Um, and they couldn't work out why their products were getting spoilage and whatever until they went and t we came in and we tested the surfaces. And they said, no, 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 we tested the surfaces, they're all clean. And they were all rotten. So you want to know that it's working at the time you're coming to use it. So test before use, not after cleaning. And if you're organising testing within a workplace, don't test on the same day each month. If you're doing it monthly or in the same week, Mix it up. Staff tend to know it's hold on, it's almost the end of the month. This 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 Wednesday, because they won't do testing, they're gonna come around and do the testing. Let's make sure we clean everything really well tonight. Because tomorrow they're gonna be coming through. Okay, you've got to mix it up. Um, I had one premises that used to um, post their results, their numeric results in the in the staff room. And when if they kept below the acceptable limit, over a, um, a, a, a four, five, six rounds of testing, then there was a, um, a, a reward system in place. You know, they had drinks on a Friday afternoon. They took everyone deep sea fishing. No, I made that up. Um, but you know, there was some sort of thing. A, you know, a standard plate counter or plate count is all you require. Don't go to testing for pathogens, don't go looking for coliforms, just do a play count, which used to be called a total bacteria count. Okay, it's, it's not all total bacteria. So they've renamed it into proper terminology as a heterotrophic play count or a mesophilic play count. So we've just forgotten that, just call it a play count. Be careful of the area that you're testing. If you're using, you know, a uh, a little what looks like a cotton swab you know, for the, that you, you see they use for cleaning ears, that sort of size swab. You can't swab a 10 by 10 square centimetre area with a swab that's got a surface area of one centimetre. You're fooling yourself. After about the first five or you know, 25 square centimetres, you're not picking up bacteria, you're painting. So you're going to get great results. You want to get great results? Swab a metre by a metre with a one square centimetre swab. And you'll always find you're getting these marvellously low counts. It just can't pick up the bugs, okay? So unless you're using those uh, sample collection kits that have a big spongy stuff, um, maybe you could do 10 by 10 square centimetres. Then the rest of the time, just stick to, and what we recommend is a 25 square centimetre area. Or you can use a contact plate. Has anyone seen those little agar plates that are overfilled? Great. Then I'll um, I'll show you one in a moment. When we do a surface swab, um, that will give you a reporting range of will give you results, and you need results in bugs or bacteria or plate count per square centimeter, not counts per swab counts per square centimetre. Now we can compare the bin to the bench to everywhere else. It's got to be per square centimetre. We can give you in a range 0 0.4 to 120. CFU is a really cute scientific way of saying bugs. So just say bugs per mill or 
bacteria per mil. With the contact plates, which we show you the stip slide, we, you go from a, a very a lot lower level, 0.05, um, up to about 10. And this is the and this is the point. An acceptable level, this is by a really old Australian standard, it was originally written for the dairy industry, but we still use it, is that in a properly cleaned and disinfected food surface, the acceptable level of bacteria is less than six CFU, or bugs, per square centimetre. So, less than six. And that's the definition of a properly cleaned and disinfected food surface. That's all you can, that's what you need to meet. Okay? So, surface swab collections. And I don't think I have a swab here. But basically with the, with the swab kit, you'll, you'll get those two in a, in a pack which look amazingly like what pathology labs supply to, to doctors because our parent company is a pathology laboratory and we get them from them, is that you're taking your swab, they come in a pack. Now, a dry swab cannot pick up bacteria from a dry surface. A wet swab can't pick up bacteria from a wet surface. They've got to be opposite. Make sense? So, if you're testing a, a wet surface, take the swab, and swab that area of, and then stick it into the tube with the transport medium, which is there. Transport media down the bottom. If you're sampling a, a dry surface, you take the, I keep doing that, you take the top off that transport tube, and you'll throw that away anyway, Take the swab, stick it into the tube, down into the jelly to moisten it, bring it back out, and then you're swabbing your, um, your actual area. Yeah. We provide little templates, and I probably can't see that against a, a white background, and it won't help at all, but um, it's basically a five by five piece of um, um, overhead projection paper with a five by five square centimetre hole cut out of it. And what you're doing is with the swab, you've moistened it, just place that against the surface and you're rolling the swab with your fingers so it, it's rotating and you're going over that area in three directions. Okay? After you've done about 15 of those, you can throw that away. Um, because you can estimate the size of five by five. And if you go slightly under or slightly over, it's going to make absolutely no difference statistically in that final result. So, you know, you guys are EHO to be doing these after a while. Um, you can, all you need to do is get with a pen and paper, and I now can draw a five by five square centimeter area really well, freehand. Uh, and that's all really all, all you need to do. When you're looking at um, the large cutting knives, we do, and the other thing is, we give 12 and a half by two centimetres. That template I still use, although I'm pretty good at estimating that area. Okay, that's what you've got to sample a set size area. If you're not sampling a set size area, you're wasting your time. Totally, you know, it's just stupid. Because you're, you're getting results of a count, count per swab. What does that mean? Well, swab the area of the of the board or a tiny little thumbprint thing. You know, how, do you, how do you compare those? What's acceptable? You know, I've seen food premises have this acceptable limit of less than 10 per swap. And why did you get that? Well, that's what the lab gives us. You know, uh, uh, it's just crazy. You need to test a set size area. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so you moisten the swab in the transport medium. Dry swabs only used on a wet surface. Hold the template against the surface. Roll the swab while moving over the entire um, surface three times. Return the swab to the transport medium. And that swab can be stored and transported at room temperature. Does not need to be refrigerated.
where we're looking at the dip slide. Basically, these are these are the dip slides. It's actually originally used in the air conditioning industry for test um, plate counts on um, in, on water, but they're a paddle with agar on both sides. Okay, and it's actually flexible. So if you don't want to go through the hassles of doing the swab, realizing that this doesn't, this only goes up to a count of, what would we say, 10 or 12 uh, as an upper, upper, upper limit of bugs, whereas the other one goes up to 120, then you basically just come along with, with, the, with the paddle to your surface, just roll it down till it touches the, the surface, lift it off, go to another area, don't, sorry, don't test the same spot twice. That's, so they go to another area beside it, just roll it down, test, place it against the surface, take that, stick it back in the jar, and then that, that cup goes to the lab. When it gets to us, we just whack it in the incubator and then count the colonies. And we know each of those sides are actually 10 square centimetres. So we can, again, we'll give you a count, and any lab will give you a count per square centimetre. So again, but obviously these can only be used on dry surfaces. You can't test wet surfaces with, a, with an agar. Move the panel from the container, gently press against the, the surface, return the panel to the tube. And again, these actually are designed to be stored at room temperature. One of the few plates that can be stored at, at room temperature. And that's room temperature for most of Australia, okay? And means you've got to have air conditioning. And if you don't have air conditioning, okay, I think you probably can put these in the fridge. <laughs> 